Thank you, Eva, and, and thank you, Pavel, and, and thank you all for uh, coming to listen uh, in English. Um, and I'm delighted to be here in your, in your beautiful city. Um, I, I have to start this way because I, uh, it is a time of, of terrible suffering in the field of addiction, and I, I, I always want to start by, by just acknowledging the many people over the last 50 years who have talked to me at great length of, and shown me at great length their, their problems and their, and their suffering. And, and um, I try never to forget them. Um, in particular now, I'm, I'm talking a lot to parents of people who have died of opioid overdoses in Canada, in my, my part of Western Canada, and um, there's nothing there's nothing harsher than those of you who are parents will know this. Of course, there's nothing harsher than losing a child in that way, and and these are these are very brave people, and and they try to help, and and <coughs> and also I'm talking to just a lot of men who, men and women, you know, who are uh, feeling that they have somehow lost their own soul and and imagine that there's there's nothing that's pretty harsh too so we have a problem and we call it drug addiction and we have a story and i think that everyone in the world knows the story that we tell about drug addiction and um the story is this that that there is a certain drug and that um, if you take this drug a few times you'll be very sorry because you will have cravings forever after for that drug and those cravings will follow you no matter how you how you deal with them they, they will follow you um, well, I, I, this I want to call the old story, but I want to say I also call it the demon drug story because there's it, you would recognize in it that there's a, an element of the demon, the the demon stories of medieval Europe, of of the demon that if you if you consort with the demon it, you will lose somehow your soul and somehow it will never you will never get it back again fully. Um, well, this some people believe that story in the in the in the very basic way that I've told it, but I think most people tend to believe it in a more complex way. So when when I went to graduate school, I'm just remembering that I promised to talk for only 60 minutes, <laughs> which <laughs> so I will keep an eye on this thing. Um, when I went to graduate school. I, I heard the same story, only, only it was told differently. Instead of talking about the drug in the, the kind of demonic way, we talked about it in those days in terms of um, the psychological, behavioral psychological theory of the day. And we explained why it was that these certain drugs would take control over a person's motivational system. And we talked about it in terms of the neuroscience of the day. Which, which involved primarily endorphins in, in those days. But it was the same story. There would be an, an irrecoverable thing would happen to you because, <clears throat> because you had used the drug and then you would have to be treated or cared for forever after, unless you were a magically strong person who could fight the demon. Well, the story is told in many different languages. Like I, I first learned it in the language of psychology, but it's also learned in the, uh, told in the language of psychoanalysis and in the language of immunology and in the language of Alcoholics Anonymous and the language of the Christian church and the Buddhist religion um, and so forth. It's told in many, many ways, but the, the old story remains pretty much the same. Now, it's softened in various ways, but it's pretty much the same. And, 
it's told about various drugs. Like right now, the old story is being told in Canada about opioids, by which we mean drugs like heroin and all the prescribed forms of those drugs, particularly uh, fentanyl, which seem to be uh, accounting for a, a epidemic of overdoses. Um, there's hundreds of variations of the story, but they fall into two groups. And the two groups are the groups that, that put the emphasis on the drug itself, the demon drug itself, uh, and, and say that, of course, we must rid the world of this demon drug, and we must tell all our children, starting in the first year of school, and before, we must tell them never to take that drug. We must make them so scared of the drug. It doesn't matter if we lie to them, but we must make them so scared of the drug that they would never take that thing because it is demonic. It is like a demon. <clears throat> the other form, the other set of variations, the second set of variations, puts the emphasis on the person who has become transformed by the drugs and says, well, this person has cravings they can never manage, but we can help them. We can, we can treat them as psychologists do, um, or we can treat them as psychoanalysts do, or we can give them acupuncture, or we can give them psychedelic drugs, or on and on and on. There are literally hundreds of treatments, and in recent times we say, well, we, or, or we can use harm reduction and the recovery movement. I'll have some special things to say about the recovery movement. But all of these have in common, all of these have in common that they're assuming that there's some transformation which has gone on in this person which is going to last a long time, and that we can, we can help it. Um, well, the past 50 years, by the way, I've been in this, this field almost exactly 50 years. Uh, so I can, I can say that. The past 50 years <laughs> has seen a, a major shift from the first set of variations to the second. So when I went into the field in my part of the world, we had a brutal war on drugs underway. I mean, it was truly brutal. I won't tell you horror stories, but I could. And now in my city, in Vancouver, we don't do that anymore. We had two major prisons in the city that were filled with drug users. Both have been torn down and made into housing, housing developments. Now what we have is um, treatment and harm reduction and the recovery movement and a lot, of, a lot of wonderful things, really. Things that, and, and we're very proud of that, that we have made that shift. But I want to emphasize at this point that it, in a certain way, it is the same old story. Now, the story has softened quite a bit, say, in the recovery movement. Um, but it is still the same old story, that, that there's something, the drug has transformed these people in some way, and that, that we will come to their rescue. We in the field of addiction, that, that is my field. I'm a psychologist in the field of addiction. We will come to their rescue. And there's a mystery. There's the mystery that after 50 years, after having made this transformation over the course of approximately 50 years, we, have, we don't have those two big prisons anymore. We don't have people being beaten by the police before, which we had a lot of. But we still have the same problem. The, as far as anyone can tell, the problem isn't any less. Um, it may be worse, and many people are willing to say it's worse, but another thing you, you need to know is that none of our statistics in this field are really any good, because we, we can't really measure who's addicted and who's not addicted. We don't really have good numbers, but all our indications are that it isn't any better in spite of this major transformation. And you might think about that for a minute. Why? Why? isn't it any better? 
Well, I, I want to tell you the answer, which I, I think I know the answer. And the answer is that everything we've done is based on the old story, and the old story is wrong. I've, I've written the old story, the four major points of the old story out here, just so you can, you can have a look at it. The old story says that addictive drugs are the, they're really the cause. They're the most important cause of our drug problem. They cause it by somehow taking control of a person. The person loses control. The, the drugs now have control of that person. And there's a second part of the cause, and that is the problem is caused because people who shouldn't have, they didn't listen to their grandfather uh, or their parents, and they went out and tried those drugs when they shouldn't. People, because they did that, there was a problem. And the fourth part of the old story is that the experts in the field of addiction are going to bring this problem under control. I want to say that all four parts of that story are wrong, and, and I, I want to try to replace them tonight. And there'll be lots of time for questions, because you may well think some parts of that story are right, and, and um, there'll be time for that as long as I watch this. Um, so there are lots of people now who are challenging one or more parts of the old story. Um, but I want to be very clear. I'm, I'm saying that all four parts of the old story are wrong, and we need a new story. <laughs> that means we're at a particular time in history. Right? We're, we're at a time of paradigm shift. <clears throat> paradigm shift means, it means that we're going to change our story completely. This, this happens in science, it happens in every, every kind of a field. There's a, there are paradigm shifts from time to time. And I want to just tell you a little, little bit more about a paradigm shift, because it's, such, it's a huge event. It, it means we have to think entirely different. And I, and I found a picture to illustrate what a paradigm shift is, and, and here's the picture. Yes. Um, now, I, I want you to look at this picture. Maybe I'll just move over here so you can enjoy that picture. I, I live in a part of the world, western part of North America, which has, for the last three years, has had terrible droughts. And that means that our forests are burning up. This is, this is a catastrophe that well, it's, it's incredible. We, uh, the, the law, if you think about it in ecological terms or any terms you want to, economic terms, it's an incredible catastrophe. This picture, which went viral on the internet, in, at least in my part of the world, uh, shows some gentlemen, and um, they are, I, I, I believe, they are attempting to improve their quality of life and um, they're concentrating very hard on what they're doing. And, and this makes a certain sense, because um, it is apparently true that, that for men of a certain age, or ladies and gentlemen of a certain age, that the quality of life is improved by golfing. Um, but what I, want, I would like to say to those gentlemen, if they were here, is that it doesn't really matter how hard you concentrate on getting the ball in the little cup, and you could even do more adventurous things. You could, you could, you could play twice as many times, or you could, you could in, really invent, change the rules of golf. You could do everything to golf, and it really wouldn't matter as much to the quality of your life as, as if you looked up and looked at that problem behind you, at the, the forest fires which are all around us. This picture, incidentally, is from quite near where I live. Um, that's what a paradigm shift is. It means a completely new story. Not only do we do, we do new kinds of research, we ask new questions. 
And I'm saying that we need that in, in the field of addiction. We need to, uh, we need a new story. And of course I have brought a new story for, for you to consider. And the new story is, um, I'm going to take a while to, to say what it is, but the new story is a negation, of course, of the old. It's not exactly just saying the old story is wrong. It's, it's, it's a whole new picture of what we need to understand to understand addiction. So, here's... Oh, I, I should mention this a little bit, that this, I call it a new story, but it, it actually isn't new. Um, Plato knew it. It has, it has many sources in, in, in the past. It's known in folk cult, spoken of in, in, in terms of addiction. Um, I want to tell you, I, I'll talk about Rat Park if, if you want me to, but um, I don't, I'm, I'm going to leave it out at this point. It's something we can come back to, and I have some slides if you want to talk about that. I want to talk about the folk culture origins of the new story, and I want to tell you a, a story which was told to me um, a tale which was told to me when I visited a, a native village in where I live in British Columbia, Canada. Uh, and I've, a lot of my work is from native um, settings in, in Canada. And it was told to me by drug counselors who were, who were women. They were women of my age, grand, grandmothers they were. And here's the story as they told it to me. But, and this, I, I just want to say this to show you that the new story has a source in folk wisdom as, as well as everything else. Here's, here's the story they told me. We are the drug counselors. And we sit by the river. Now, now you can imagine a Canadian mountain river. It's in the north. They are very big and very full of water and, and, and very dangerous. So we sit by the river and we look out in the water and once in a while we see there's a person out there lost in the, in the water and they're going to die. And we swim to them. We swim through the raging water and we know how to do it because our ancestors told us where the rocks are. We go around the rocks and we find, we get to the person and by that time we're almost out of, we're almost out of breath. We're almost sinking ourselves. We grab the person. We drag them back to the shore. We fling them with our last strength up on the, on the side of the river. And sometimes they get up from there and they walk back into the land and rejoin the people. And sometimes they slip right off and fall back in the water again. But sometimes they do. They, they rejoin the people. And therefore, we are like warriors. Our work is, is great, except for one thing. Some son of a bitch upstream keeps throwing more people in the water every year. <laughs> that's the new story. That's, that's an old version of the new story. I'm going to tell a, a, a better version of it now. This, this is my version of the news story. There's a man in the middle who... Um, is it, well, let me say this. The, the news story is about modernity. It's about the modern age, which in, in academic terms, we say the modern age is, is not just the last five minutes. It's, it's the last five centuries. We're talking about the modern age, and we're, we're using a man as a symbol of the modern age. Now, I've chosen this man because... It makes sense to English-speaking audiences that I would choose him. Um, it's, it's Christopher Columbus, because he's um, 500 years ago he did his most important research uh, <laughs> uh, and, and came to the New World. But I think maybe it would make more sense in, 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 a, in a European audience if I put maybe Martin Luther in the center of the picture or um, Peter the Great, or Ferdinand the uh, First, I don't know, but people who are, the, who are the authors of modernity, of the modern age. And I want to say that 
the, um, the problem of addiction is built into the modern age. And as, the, as we become more modern, we become more addicted. And obviously this, this means that, that we have to look a little more carefully at what the modern age is. I mean, we all talk about modern. In fact, in, in a few conversations I've had with people speaking Czech, uh, I've, I've heard the word modern, I know it's a word, uh, but, but we have to ask ourselves like more precisely, what does the modern age mean? It's a period of, let's say, the last 500 years. Let's say, if you, if you may, if I may, starting with Columbus, it's it's a period where the world um, colonized. That is to say, the strong powers started taking over everybody else and started introducing a globalization of everything, of knowledge, of religion, of trade, of everything, and. Um, it is also the, the, the period of the Enlightenment. It's the period which gave us modern science. And it's also the period which gave us modern economics. Free market economics are a, are a component of the modern age. And it is, it is also the, the age of a certain kind of flamboyant individualism. Um, and it's also the age of an incredible technology which is so powerful that it bends our minds without us even knowing they're being bent uh, through through our computers and internets and, and, and this and that. So it's both individualistic and it's mind control technology. This, this is the modern age. It's an age of contradictions. Uh, everybody talks about it. Um, I, th I think um, Perhaps, perhaps Franz Kafka can be understood that way. I mean, what's he writing about? He's writing the, about the bureaucratic horrors of the late Habsburg Empire. Um, everybody writes about it. I, I prepared for coming here by reading one, by reading um, Václav Havel's famous 1978 speech. He writes about the modern age, and, and he writes about it making clear, of course, mostly he's writing about the modern age in the Soviet bloc, but, but he's also writing about the Western democracies, and he says so. He says, don't, don't just think that you, you get out of this by, by changing your allegiance here. The, the modern age is, is there for everybody. That's the problem of modernity. And the new story, I say, I say the new story is that as modernity increases, as progress increases, um, addiction increases. Of course, not only addiction increases, so does global warming, so does income inequality, so do, uh, I mean, the, the modernity has all kinds of consequences, um, and maybe addiction isn't the most problematic, maybe it's not the most dire consequence, but it's it's dire enough, and that's that's the one we'll talk about tonight. Although it's it's related to all the others. So what is, I mean, in terms of if we look at the modernity in terms of addiction, what do we see? Well, we see that um, modernity fragments culture. It, from my North American point of view, we you know we see it in the terms of the, the Native Indian people who had wonderfully well-developed, complex cultures, and th those cultures were just crushed by the colonizers, the English guys, my, my ancestors. Um, and in, in crushing the, the native people, the English guys not only crushed the native people, they crushed their own society. They had to, they had to drive people off the land all over England um, in order to produce the trading goods. The, their main trading good in Canada was blankets. Um, so they had, to, they had to clear the land, clear the farms, so that they could have a huge industrial sheep raising operations, so they could cheaply manufacture wonderful Canadian blankets called uh, Hudson's Bay blankets, uh, which, which the natives would trade their 
their soul or sometimes their wife for for a Hudson Bay blanket. They were they were so good, but it required it required um, destroying the farming culture of, of most of England and Scotland, where my ancestors actually do come from. Um, and it also destroyed the British upper class because it put the British it divided the British upper class into a new form of of um, industrial culture where where people were competing with each other without the old codes of honor they were competing industrially and and it created it uh, it ravaged the the previous upper class culture which had its had its own problems incidentally i'm talking about the problems of modernity this is not to say that every epoch doesn't have its problems this is not to say we should go back to the stone age this is only to say that, that if we look at the problems of modernity, we see that they, they, they bring us the addiction problem and that we have to, we, we must start there if, we, if we're going to understand it. So, so what does, what happens? Well, well, modernity creates this fragmentation and um, it's everywhere. And this fragmentation produces, so there we start with a fragmented society on the top of this picture. You see we're going to make a circle before we're done. Um, produces mass dislocation. That is, the effect of, of fragmenting cultures is, is, to fragment, is to dislocate human beings. And, and, and that is because you know, we, we all exist to the extent that we exist in a in a full and healthy and wholesome way, we exist within a culture. Human beings are never solitary creatures. They always exist within a culture. Um, and to the extent that we fracture culture, fragment culture, we dislocate human beings. And and this this concept of dislocation, again, it's something that everybody writes about, or everybody well, or they write poems about it or paint pictures of it. It's, it, it means that somehow people are, are not fully whole. In my um, Christian upbringing, by the way, I'm not a Christian anymore, but um, <laughs> in my Christian upbringing, we would say that, that we, we would speak of the, the peace that passes all understanding meaning the peace that comes from being with your understanding of God and with your relationship with your, with your parents and your, and your community and, and so forth. In, in sociological terms, people speak of alienation. Um, actually, I think, again, Franz Kafka is very good at speaking of alienation, of, of being so shocked by the absence of, of real society that that a person is just rendered um, shocked and, and dazed and, and, and out of it. So we can talk about it in religious language, we can talk about it in sociological language, in psychological language, and I am a psychologist, we talk about it in terms of, of the diminished sense of attachment, belonging, meaning, purpose, identity. We use those five words in particular. And, and for those, any of those, or all of those, to be diminished is to be dislocated. It means we don't know who we are, and we don't know why we are, and we don't know why we care. Um, and existentialists have a whole vocabulary for talking about it. So, that, so existentialists speak of nothingness, the feeling of nothingness, or the feeling of absurdity in bourgeois society. Um, again, these are all vocabularies that can be used to describe dislocation, because it's a, it's a, it's a hard term to grasp. It's, you can't measure it, and you can't count it, and you have no, uh, will present no graphs with frequency of dislocation, but everybody talks about it. Uh, it's not being all there. And it, my favorite way to say it is it's not having a life. This is a, I don't know if you know this expression, but it, you say it to somebody, they don't have a life. 
what do, what do you mean when you say that? You mean they're dislocated. That's, that's what it means. Um, well, dislocation is, it can be fun, um, but in the long run, it's, it's very hard. Um, there's all kinds of studies on the long-term effects of dislocation. Eventually, it breaks people down. Durkheim, for example, is writing about suicide and essentially dislocated people. Every, again, everybody, I say everybody, but lots and lots of, of scholars write about this. By the way, tonight, um, I'm not presenting any evidence, but that doesn't mean I don't have lots of evidence. I, I simply want to tell you the idea. If you are interested in these ideas, may I suggest that, that uh, you go to my website um, or, or read my, my big fat book, um, because there's lots of evidence for all I'm saying. And I'm drawing in the evidence primarily from anthropology, from history, from sociology, and to a certain extent from clinical psychology. But there's tons of evidence, um, and, and I would be happy to um, pile evidence very, very high if you want me to. But you'll have to invite me not just for an hour, but for a whole semester. <laughs> And then we could do that. Um, there's tons of evidence for all of this. Dislocation is, is terrible. Um, the most, um, it's, what, it's a fact now that, that modern, the modern technology of torture, which has been developed primarily by the Americans as far as I know, involves extreme dislocation, and that's on purpose. Like if you've seen pictures of people that the Americans are taking to their torture places, they have hoods on. Why do they have hoods on? They don't need hoods. Uh, they have hoods on so that they can be isolated from all human contact. Disloc extreme dislocation by design is part of all modern torture that I'm, that I'm aware of because people understand that, that dislocation is as much the agent, the uh, active agency and torture as, as anything else. Okay. Oh. How did that get there? Mm -hmm. um, the third part of this vicious circle that I'm drawing here is, is a flood of addictions because it is, it is a historical fact that where cultures are destroyed or fragmented, addiction follows. And the, the most, the answer, the, the example of that, which is most familiar to me and which I have the most evidence about is, is Canadian Indians, because our, my part of Canada is the West, and it wasn't colonized until the 19th century that means that, in many cases, the anthropologists arrived before the soldiers. And so we know a lot about these people before they were colonized. And we, we know, for example, that you know, they, they weren't noble savages. They had all kinds of problems, just like everybody has problems, just like the colonizers. They had slaves, and they had wars, and they had, um, they had mental health problems. They had all kinds of problems except addiction. As far as we can tell, the, the, the incidence of addiction was almost zero in these, in these native Indian people until they were colonized. And then they became, um, in many cases, 100% addicted. There are, in fact, there are still villages in my province where we can say that they are 100% addicted in the sense that every adult is either alcoholic or drug addicted, or on the wagon. Do you know that expression? On the wagon means they're abstaining. Everyone. So this was the consequence of of, dis, of mass dislocate, mass radical dislocation. It, it people turned to addiction in, in very visible ways. Of course, they weren't just addicted to to drugs. But we'll come to that. Um, 
Another example from, from the United States, which I think is, is important, is, is methamphetamine. Um, the United States is not having a methamphetamine panic right now, but it had one about 15 years ago. And, and for a while, the, it was very difficult to understand why all of a sudden people were dying of methamphetamine and people were lying on the streets and the police were helping them up. And then, you know, I, that image comes to mind because when I got off the train in Brno yesterday, there was a man lying on the street and the police were helping him up. And I thought, oh, just like home. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, but the methamphetamine panic that we had has come and gone, but when it was there, it was um, puzzling at first. Why all of a sudden methamphetamine? And then the answer became clear. The methamphetamine the, in our situation was primarily in the inner states. It was not in the coastal states. It was on the inner states of, and the inner provinces of, of, of North America. United States and Canada, and it was there because the, the farms had been radically reorganized a few years earlier so that to, to break down the last remaining small farms, so the farming was being industrialized to an extent it never had been before, which meant that a lot of people were driven off the farms, and at the same time a lot of Mexican laborers were coming working in the, the packing plants where the in other words, doing the industrial farming labor. Um, so a lot of, of American people were, were simply fragmented. Their whole lives were fragmented. They were dislocated. And, and they all had out in the barn fertilizers, which, which with a little bit of work could be converted into methamphetamine. I don't, I don't know the recipe, but it is said that with a little bit of work they can make, you can make methamphetamine. And, and that's why there was a methamphetamine panic. There was a very definite reason for it, and the reason was dislocation. So that, that formula works over and over again. Um, and but why? Why would a dislocated person become addicted? Well, it, it, it is obvious, I think, that if, if you don't have a life, if dislocation means you, you don't have a life, addiction will give you a life. In, in my city, if you, if you don't have a life, if, but you've got 20 bucks, 20 dollars, you can just take it and you go downtown to a certain street and you hold out your 20 dollars and someone will take it away and, and they'll give you a little white powder. And for the white powder, you, you not only get, get a nice feeling from injecting it, but you, you become a junkie. That is to say, you become a part of a community, and, and really it is a community. You, you have to study it for a few decades, as I have, to, to know that. But it, but it really is a community, and not only is it a community of, of you know, junkies help each other and, and steal from each other and, and, and do all this stuff, but, but you're no longer nobody. And not, not only that, there's a mystique, the junkie mystique. Some of our most wonderful celebrities, from time to time, one of our most wonderful celebrities dies of an overdose of, of an opiate drug like heroin or, or one of the others. Um, and and, and these, are, these are heroes that everybody knows, Kurt Cobain and Philip Seymour Hoffman, and you, maybe these names are not so familiar. But these are, these are wonderful celebrities, and they just keep keeling over from, from um, opiate overdoses. Well, there's a mystique, and the mystique is that I'm part of this group, which not only includes my scabby friends down here on the street, but also these, these great heroes. Um, and there, again, there's, there's a huge literature on this. I can just point to it. Um, and incidentally, if you want the references, send me an email, and I'll send you the references. Uh, yeah, there's a huge literature on this. The, the junkie identity is a very, very powerful cause of addiction. Why do dislocated people need a junkie identity? Because that's what dislocated is. They don't have an identity. They, they get it that way. Um, so, without their addictions, I love this sentence, I wrote it. Without their addictions, 
Many dislocated people would have terrifyingly little reason to live and would risk succumbing to anxiety, depression, or suicide. Addiction is, is not much, but it, it's better than nothing at all. That's, that's why dislocated people have such, such a, a vulnerability to addiction. Um, and it isn't just addiction to drugs. In fact, nothing that I've been saying about addiction applies only to drugs. For example, um, gamblers. We, we have a big gambling addiction problem now, too. Well, it's, it's the same. When you gamble, you not only get to lose your money, you also get to be, to entertain this fantasy of what if I won, and to hang around with people at the track or you know other gamblers and people cheer when you when you win when you beat the slot machine or the, the video poker machine or whatever it is and in in the newer forms of machine gambling people form relationships not with other people but with the machines there's a beautiful book about this by a, a sociologist about about people about the the devilish design of these new gambling machines which are designed to, to keep a flow of interaction back and forth, which is not human interaction, it's, it's person-machine interaction, but it's, it's intriguing. And, it, and people get in what's called the zone. The zone means they're, they're in, a, in a level of interaction which is just like an intense conversation that you would never want to leave, except that it goes on forever and then you have to keep putting money in <laughs> to, to be in the zone. But, yeah, so, so addictions, all addictions, provide this kind of alternative for, to dislocation. They provide some kind of engagement, some kind of having a life. People sometimes say about pornography addiction, well, that's all alone, the person's all alone. Well, no, they're not all alone. They're sitting there with, with all these the men, usually, for pornography addiction, they're sitting here with all these beautiful girls, and, and these girls are, are doing all these gymnastics on the, on the screen, and, and they're interacting in, in, in um, very intense ways. So I, I think addiction is best understood, all addiction is best understood as kind of interactions um, not necessarily social, but way better than dislocation because dislocation is really the absence of interactions, right? Dislocation is a cruel solitude and, and addiction is a cruel alternative to solitude. Um, so, now we're talking about addiction as a form of adaptation. Right? We're saying um, The addicted person is not out of control at all. They're not out of control. What they're doing is the best thing they can in a def desperate situation. They, you, could, you could picture them as a drowning person who's flailing around. They're going to go under. They're in the ocean. And they grab onto whatever junk they can. And addiction is like that. People, people grab onto whatever lifestyle they can grab onto. And it's not wonderful. But it's not nothing. It's it's the alternative to nothing. Um, but but think about this a little further. I'm I'm thinking now about the old story again and the new story. The old story says, well, we need addiction professionals to to get people out of this loss of control. But but this adaption idea says that addiction is an adaptation. We don't. People really haven't lost control. I mean, they're behaving badly, and they're going, they may kill themselves, but the larger number of them are going to stop. That is, people get addicted to go through difficult problems, stages of dislocation, and most of them stop. And we could prove that if we had time. We could go around this room, or any room, and we could ask each person, have you ever been addicted? Not necessarily to a drug, 
by or to but to anything you could be addicted to <coughs> to gambling or pornography or money or power or shoes in the closet or um, cosmetic surgery or um, anything the list goes on forever and what we will do this experiment has been done I've done it myself I know lots of people have done it we will find that a few of you will say oh yeah I, I have been addicted and I still am but many of you will say yes I had a serious addiction problem and I stopped so and, and why did you stop well because I figured out it was it was bad for me it was going to kill me and I found something better to do Many people stop their addictions when they, you know, they get a job or they, they get a, a reconciliation or they get somehow they, where they didn't have a life, they do have a life. Well, now we're talking about addiction you see in a completely different way than the old story. So let me go on. Um, I should add just this, that I've, I've been saying addiction is adaptive for individuals. It's also adaptive for society. I mean, you know that, right? That society requires that people, I'm talking about modern economic free, free market society, requires that people overconsume, or we could say consume addictively, and it requires that people overwork in order to, to do the, the kinds of production that are are required. Addiction is 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 kind of handy. It's it's not just adaptive for individuals. It's adaptive for culture. Um, now I, I want to show you a couple of slides. Well, not too much. But <laughs> I'm going to give this talk tomorrow, so I have some extra slides that I'm not going to show you. But I want to show you something. We'll come back to the news story. This, this is a journal article that everybody should read, I think. I hope you will write it down and, and read it. Uh, you can see the reference, it's 2011. And, and this, was a, this, was, this was what's called a meta-analysis. They, they did it by reading all the studies of addiction that were ever written, literally, they did that. And, and what they, find, they found is that, now this is American, they found that in the United States, in, any, in, it, in the previous, in any 12 month period in the United States, 15% of people are alcoholic, no sorry, 15% of people um, are smoking addictively, 10% are alcoholic, 5% are using illicit drugs addictively. 2% are eating addictively. Um, gluttony, um, obesity, that kind of eating. Incidentally, all these numbers are not just saying that people were eating, it's saying that they're eating addictively. And, the, and that's why you need to read the study because some, some of these things are hard to believe and like you actually read the the ways in which they gathered these data. But 2% of the people are, are uh, eating addictively, 2% um, are gambling addictively, 2% are uh, use the internet addictively, 3% are, are, have addictive love relations, 6% have, or sorry, 3% have addicted sex problems, 3% have, are addicted to exercise, 10% work, and 6% shopping. And all these things we can kind of giggle at, you know, because, well, addicted to shopping, sure. But, 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 but um, they're talking about people who are really, really, really addicted to shopping, meaning people who, who use up their credit cards and go into debt and can't pay and then lose their, their marriage and their, and their homes and, and so forth. They're talking about serious addictions. And, and maybe we could say, well, that's just Americans, only 6% of them would do that. <coughs> Um, and it probably is. Probably the United States is, is worse in, in these regards than Canada and, and maybe worse than the Czech Republic, but it's not that different. If you add all these percentages up, you get 61%. Does that mean that 61% of Americans are, are addicted in any 12-month period? Well, no, no, because 
because they can be addicted to more than one thing. And, and incidentally, you know, most, many, or most addicted people are addicted to more than one thing. So what percentage of Americans are actually addicted in any 12-month period? They, they, they did a complicated analysis, um, which I don't fully understand, and came up with the number 47%. They say 47% of Americans are actually addicted to one or more things, including illicit drugs, in a 12-month in a period. And I'll just, I will not show you those numbers. Um, I want to go on. Um, the fourth stage of this cycle is that because, because people are, so many people are addicted, uh, there are consequences for society. There's short-term consequences, which is that, you know, the, the majority of addicted people do recover, even though this is not something we emphasize in the field of addiction, but the majority of people do recover. Most people, by the time they get into treatment, are not likely to recover, but mo the majority of people never get into treatment and, and recover before that. But also, there are all kinds of, of long-term harms of addiction. Now, we think of the long-term harms of of drug addiction, I mean, those are well known, or alcoholism, like it wrecks families and, and hurts people's health, it's terrible. But what about the long-term consequences of being addicted to money and power, let's say, in the hands of people who are CEOs of, for example, Canadian mining companies, which do a huge amount of damage around the third world because they are so greedy for their, to make all this money that they, they do tremendous harm, not only to the earth, but to, but to human beings who, are, who fall under their power. And, and these are terrible stories. What about, what about all the kinds of industrial um, abuses that go on? Can we blame those all on addiction? Maybe not. But we can blame a lot of them on addiction. And again, I appeal, I appeal to the literature that you probably haven't read, but there's a when you look at people, you don't know so much about people when they're alive, but when you look at people after they're dead through biographies, what you find is a great number of people who have been robber barons in, an, in industry are in fact addicted to wealth in, in one way or another. There's a whole book about it called Wealth Addiction. It's not to say that everybody is, but it's to say that addiction does a lot of harm. Um, it, in addiction, in fact, fragments society. You see, the, this completes the circle. And, and this, I submit, is, is one of the key problems of modernity. That we have this addiction problem. Addiction is built into modernity, and it, it magnifies itself. It, it, it's a vicious cycle, right? It's a, it's a positive feedback loop. It, it increases itself. Um, that's a big problem. It's, it is, in fact, a new story, which completely negates the old story. Now, why can I tell you this new story? With The reason I want you to, the reason I think it's true is that a great many people are working at the four pillars, the four components of the old story, tearing them apart, like, like this is going on all over. The old story is, is wrong, except that the, the, the people who are tearing it apart are just doing it one pillar at a time. And there's, there's a certain number of people, and I, I would say this is an emerging trend in the addiction field, of people who are saying the old story is completely wrong, and here's a new story. Now, this, this new story has not captured the entire field of addiction by any means. But I submit to you that this, look for it. It's coming. Here's the new story. Many people adapt to dislocation with long-term destructive addictions. Yes. The challenge of our times is replacing the modern epoch with an epoch more fit. Oh, how come it all says one? <laughs> 
something that we, the machine has interfered with my, this is a little bit of machine by uh, sabotage, I think, but number one, modernity brings a global flood of addiction to Two, it should say, many people adapt to dislocation with long-lived destructive addictions. And three, the challenge of our times is replacing the modern epoch with an epoch more fit for human habitation. Now, it sounds like I'm standing up here saying that the only way to solve the problem of addiction is to actually replace modernity, to bring modernity to an end. Well. I am. Um, that, that's right. That's, but it's not as strange as it seems because, first of all, think where we are in history. We really are at the end of an epoch. We, we have reached a point where, for example, we are gonna re, we're going to reach structure or replace modernity or we're going to have, we're going to destroy the planet. I think we probably mostly all know that. Um, we've reached a point where the limits of, of our global economic system are becoming so glaringly obvious in terms of income inequality and incredible um, economic variations. Uh, it's impossible. Actually, modernity is worn out. We are going to change it, and we don't have to change it just for addiction, but we have, to, we have to keep in mind that as we move into this new epoch, which of course will be a process of decades and centuries, as we move into this process, we have to replace the modern epoch with an epoch which is more fit for human habitation. That was, I think, the key flaw in modernity was that it was built on the assumption that people can take anything. You can make them into slaves, you can make them into colonies, you can make them into uh, computer peons, uh, you, can, you, can, you can make them into anything, anything you want to and, and it'll be all right. Somehow they'll, they'll adapt to that. Well, no. The late modernity has proven in, inhospitable or inhab uninhabitable, really, and and we're going to have to change it. And um, when I say that in in Canada, of course, not everybody agrees. In fact, a lot of people think that's mad. And and one of the reasons I was so easy, so eager to come here, is is I think that. Um, you guys have a different history than us. I think in the last, let's say since 1900, you have seen incredible social changes. I think you have seen three empires come and go. I think you've been in the middle of, of the most destructive war there ever was in World War II. Um, you, I think you have you know, split from one big country to two smaller countries. I think you have seen incredible changes, and I, I think maybe it is easy for, easier for you than for Canadians to imagine that, that we're, we're about to undergo another ethical shift, a shift of epochs, and that, and that this ethical shift is, is probably a good thing. Um, and I, I guess I would like to Stop right there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I, I know there will be questions, and um, I'm looking forward to them. Bruce, do you want the chair? Bruce. Uh, Put a microphone. Do you think we need a microphone, or it's okay just to ask questions from the public? Okay. Can Can I speak without the microphone? Yeah. yeah. All right. You can hear me. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> if I fade, I, I may fade. But you you just do this, right? If I fade, and so I'll try to keep talking loud. And do you do you need a chair? Do you, do you want 
Do I need a chair? Um, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm fine to stand. Can I ask yes, sir. a question? So, what you said about dislocation and the uh, anomie, however, it, whether you, we use the psychological language or the sociological language, it really um, is very convincing and very interesting. However, uh, I'm just coming from the transpersonal conference, and, and there was this attitude more than, um, let's say, that we just need to reach, um, to quote Ken Wilber, the critical mass of global consciousness. And so, my question is. Yeah. Um, how do we actually uh, move forward toward this new epoch? Is it, for example, do you think that the main issue is capitalism, consumerism, or maybe urban planning? I mean, this is all a, a piece of the bigger yeah. picture. But yeah. what, like in practice, what should we tackle first as a society? Yeah. So, so the question is, uh, how would we move forward to this new epoch? Um, up until two days ago, I, I would have said that the person who answers that question most clearly uh, is Pope Francis, who, who writes about that. But I, again, I am not a religious person, and, and he writes, he's an amazing thinker. But really, two days ago, I, I read uh, Vaclav Havel, his 1978 paper, and I was moved by that. I, I don't know why I had never read it before. And, and do you know this paper? Which one? Which one? 1978, it's called, in English, it's called Power of the Powerless. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay, in this, in this paper he talks about the <coughs> powerlessness of people under the Soviet Union, and he also says, you know, really it's not that much different in the, in the Western democracies, and, and he said, but where does the power of powerless people come from? And he says it's, he uses this phrase in English. This is all as translated in English to me. He says, um, living within the truth. And, and what he means by that is um, telling the truth with, with your life. And he gives some examples of of, of people who do it. And, but the example I would like to give is the, uh, the drug addiction field, or the, the addiction field, which is part of my field. Um, if, how are we going to move forward to the new epic? Well, here's one example for people who are in the, the uh, addiction field. Are any of you in the addiction field? Yeah, yeah, good. But not all of you. But, but if you're in the addiction field, Here's a field where we have been living a lie. The lie is the old story, right? The old story says, well, all our problems are caused by these drugs, and don't worry, we'll fix it for you. Well, it's a lie. We can't do it. Now, many people in the addiction field are, I mean, everybody that I know in the addiction field are really sincere people. They really do help other people. They care. They're doing what they're doing for all the right reasons, but they're not solving the problem. Even as I said, we've, we've made this 50-year this shift from the old versions, from, from one set of variations of the old story to a new set of variations of the old story. We're much more humane. We're much more scientific. We're much more compassionate than we used to be but our results aren't any better. Why not? Because the old story is wrong. Um, what, how do we live within the truth? Well, we could, tell, we could all tell my new story, but maybe, maybe my new story is right, but we all know the old story is, is wrong, and we need, to, we need to do something about that. For example, in my part of the world, some of the very bravest people during the war on drugs were policemen. And some of the policemen were, were not so brave. They did terrible things in my city, but some of them were very brave. And the very brave ones stood up and went on television and everything else, and they said, it's not working. We cannot police our way out of this problem. You have to try something else. We can't solve it with our police methods. The police who did that got in big trouble with the other cops, and you know it was not a 
It was not easy for them to say that. Uh, but eventually now, most policemen say that. So now in our city, the most policemen have shifted over from the drug war variations to the person-centered variations. It's much better. It's a better world because those policemen do that. I think, I think in the case of the addiction field, I, I think that, that we need to say, look, we can treat or harm reduce or even recovery movement our way out of out of this addiction problem and it's not a drug addiction problem. We only call it a drug addiction problem to simplify it because then it seems like we can manage it but if we if we realize that it's in a much bigger problem than that and that it's fully fully as harmful outside of the area of drugs as it is within the area of drugs suddenly we've we've broken the frame right Suddenly we're in a whole new world. It's, in a way, it's a more dangerous world, but it's true. We're living within the truth. Um, and I think that that kind of change is the way that society changes. And I, people are doing that everywhere. Like in my, in my part of the world, the big heroes are the, the people who are standing up against the pipelines. I mean, you probably know this about Canada, that we make, we make the, the, the dirtiest oil on earth. We, we get it out of our so-called tar sands, and it takes so much carbon pollution in order to actually draw the, the uh, pet petroleum out of that tar that, that it's in, that, that, that it's, it's hugely dirty in terms of, of its polluting process. Well, people, are, people within the industry are admitting that and, 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 and fighting it. And people, of course, outside the industry have been fighting it for a long time. That's how we get to the, the new epoch. It, I mean, that new epoch is gonna destroy the modern petroleum industry. Well, good. Um, the, I think the, the uh, if people in the addiction field live within the addiction, um, live within the truth and, and tell the truth about addiction. It's not going to destroy, destroy the addiction field. Of course, we, you know, there's still going to be people suffering from terrible addiction problems 50 years from now and 100 years from now. We, we're, not going to solve, we're not going to make it go away all at once and the kinds of treatment and stuff that we offer is, is really worth offering. I mean, it, it really does help some people and it's, it's very useful and, and, and we're going to continue doing that. So we're not going to destroy our own field, but we are going to live within the truth. So, maybe okay. that. Well, okay. Yes, yes, ma'am. Well, um, I came from the same conference, and one of the big, big topics there were actually psychedelics, mm -hmm. and uh, according to the researches or treatment centers which are already available in the world, psychedelics are an effective medicine to treat addictions, and. Uh, the, the topic of the conference we attended was actually beyond materialism towards wholeness. And uh, there is, uh, again, the, the sense of unity, which I actually think is very related to the dislocation. So yes. do you think that psychedelics could actually be an effective tool to even maybe protect the people before they get dislocated, like to get them into society so then actually recreation yeah. of values would not be that bad because could involve people into, um, we can say, <laughs> a group of people who are using drugs but which are not addictive. Community. Yes, I mean, I, I don't really know the answer except in a personal way. And I, I, would, just, I would answer, if you don't mind, just in terms of my own life. Um, I'm 77 years old. I, I'm a product of the of the, the 1960s in Canada, which was a time when lots of people used psychedelics. Um, so I am, I am, I'm a user, um, a former user. After a while you get too old and it, it, it's, they're too powerful. But, but yeah, I have great hope for the psychedelic movement and, it's, and I think it's, it's growing all over, all over the world where I go. Um, and I think there's a lot of hope that, that psychedelics will relieve some people who are already addicted and perhaps help some people who, who might otherwise become addicted. Um, 
and, and there are a lot of wonderful people who are involved in that process, but, but, I, I don't think it's any better than any of the really good forms of treatment that we already have. Like we already have various kinds of CBT and, and, and you know, uh, AA treatment and all kinds of other treatments. Each of them works for some people. And, and, and it's, this, is, this is where the, the real disharmony is in the addiction, pe in the addiction field. People look at other, other people's treatment and they say, well, that's junk, you're just hurting other people. It's not true. All the forms of treatment help some kinds of people. And I think the psychedelics will help a, a whole other kind of, of people, and, I, and I'm totally for it. But I, I don't believe, well, you know what I believe. I believe the new story. I don't believe there's any hope that psychedelics will will give us a world consciousness uh, that will that will somehow transform the the modern era into something better. If they do, I'm I'm for it. And I, I mean, even though I don't want to take them anymore, I, I'm totally for it. But um, I can't see why it would. It seems to me that, for example, if you go back a hundred years, you know, people were were using laughing gas, NO2, in a you know, in a way that was presumably going to be very helpful for, for psychic, you know, psychological health, and it probably was for a certain number of people. But, but I, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's going to get us there. But, but I hope it does. Okay. Yes. Uh, thanks for the talk, Bruce. It really enlightening. And you know, I've been following you for years. I really like everything that you've written. And um, but I just, I've been doing quite a lot of reading recently around the impact that trauma, especially transgenerational trauma, and um, you know, and I think I think the the whole indigenous nation of people have been traumatised, and I think this whole uh, parts of society that's been traumatised by this whole dislocation. I just wondered what's your views on the role that trauma has got on addiction as well. Well, the role, the role that trauma plays. Yeah. So the question is, what is the role of trauma in addiction? Um, it is. It is the case. I don't. Do you know the name Gabor Mate? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Gabor is a friend of mine, and um, I've talked with him about it a lot. And and it, he says it's the case that in every case of, of uh, drug addiction that he has treated, there's been some kind of an identifiable, identifiable trauma in the family and um, sexual or physical abuse trauma of the child. And, and that may be true, um, but I, I really don't think it's the full picture. Um, I think, of course it's important, of course many people have have physical or sexual abuse in their past, but do 47% of Americans have physical or sexual abuse in their past? I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I think that trauma is is one of the, of course it's a risk factor, it's a huge risk factor, but, but I, I think it's being overplayed now. I think it is the case, number one, that an awful lot of people have have been traumatized and do not become addicted, and, and on the other hand, it's the case that families in which a child is traumatized have all kinds of other dislocation problems. They, it isn't just that one day the family decides we're going to sexually abuse the child and uh, every other day they're normal. That's not what happens. So I, so I think that the, that the role of trauma is, is of course important for many people. And, and you know, it's important to explore one's own traumas, if, especially if a, if a memory has been lost or something. It's terribly important. 